Today on Energetically You, I am interviewing Vanessa Hartman of Vanessa Holistic Living. She also has her own podcast, which is called Seeds of Courage. She is a holistic wellness and minimalism mentor. I'm so excited to dive deep with her on the subject of minimalism because I think this is a huge topic going forward in the age of information overwhelm. The more that our our lives and our spaces can be minimal, the more relaxed and at ease we're going to be. But let's get her take on it right away. Hey, Vanessa, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I am so excited that, quite frankly, we get to know each other a little better and uh, share with our collective audiences, you know, one of the major perks of social media and finding like-minded women around the world. We're both in North America uh, in this case. However, for me, like one of the blessings of the pandemic was having to expand my network. And I have met, met so many incredible women. I'm really optimistic, quite honestly, about the future of the world based on how many incredible women there are on, you know, across the world. But what has your experience been and, and what are your thoughts on, on the pluses of social media? So I actually was not on social media for quite a while and I have dove into it the last two and a half years really like becoming an entrepreneur and different things but it's if you use it as a tool very intentionally it is an awesome awesome tool because um we're a military family and we move all the time and I have met so many amazing people I have connected with so many amazing homeschoolers and moms and all these people everywhere that I could just be like, Oh yeah, I'm on a plane. I'm showing up this place. Like I want to meet some like people that I have met through this social media connection. And they're like, meet me in the forest and let's go do this. That it's a very intentional of using that as like, I want to get inspired. I don't want to be lowering my energy, getting drug into all the things. And so I feel like when you show up and you open your app and you use it intentionally, you meet awesome people. Yeah, I think let's let's uh, dive into that a little bit more because I, I in the same way, I don't just mindlessly scroll. I mean, at one point in my life, I definitely did that, but partly because now it's my business and, but mostly because uh, I have a very intentional curated feed. What, what I want to consume on a daily basis are are things that really inspire me, nothing that triggers me, nothing that like pulls me into a spiral of some sort of comparison. And um, just like how we met, I look for like-minded women that are doing oftentimes similar things, but are really, you know, um, doing like a subset of something that I'm really interested in so that I can, I can learn from them. Um, And I, was really, I loved your, your minimal, is it minimalist or minimalism mentor? Either way, uh, that's always been something that I have thread into my work with my clients, but it's not my, one of my major, major things. And I think it does overlap beautifully with, um, digital wellness around the same topic. You know, it's all about being intentional with what you're spending your energy on what you're consuming and, and, you know, your spaces really. And, and, and for me, one of the, one of my spaces that I spend a lot of time, you know, probably a couple hours a day still is the online space. And so it's important to curate even for yourself, like what it is um, that you want to want to do and interact with. And, but anyway, I'm thrilled that we've met And I'm curious to hear more about how you really got interested in minimalism and how long you've been doing that. So I think I became a minimalist before there was a title for it in this fad and all this stuff. Um, 
my husband and I have been married for 13 years and he got deployed to Iraq and I went to a yoga teacher training. Sorry, my voice is like all raspy and all over the place right now. But um, so nice. I went to a yoga teacher training and um, came back a minimalist without even trying. Um, they don't teach minimalism in yoga teacher training. So don't get scared that you have to go be a yoga instructor and become a minimalist. That's not how it works. But um, I came back and just like started taking stuff off the wall and was like, why do we have all these DVDs? Why do we have bookshelves? Like, so I got donated all this stuff while he was gone. I don't think he actually realized it wasn't even there when he got back home. Um, we were living in Hawaii, like in an apartment. We didn't have a lot of stuff to begin with. But after that, like about nine months after that, we had our son and I was so glad that I just started off being like a minimalist mom from the beginning because having like, oh, a toy for this and then a swing and a crib that you never sleep in and all these things, like it just, I never had to go through all that. And so to me, motherhood was straight to the point. What does my child need? What's, why is he crying? Like, it was not all these other distractions and you're like, oh my gosh, I have this giant playroom. I need to like clean up all the things. And now like our house is very easy to manage. And it'll be like, hey, Kai, can you like go check in with your room before we go to bed? And he can manage all his own stuff. And so I kind of fell into minimalism before now. Like it's a pretty popular thing, which is awesome because everyone's life would be so much more enjoyable with that and I'm glad it's like this huge movement now but I think I got into it before it was really even becoming a thing which makes me feel a lot older than I think I actually am (laughs) yeah well for me the first time I, I experienced it was when I was 30 and I sold everything and went on my own eat pray love kind of journey if you will although I'm still in my first stop 12 years later Uh, but the first two years I lived in Mexico, I just had the backpack that I came down with and I didn't really, I had a bed and, uh, a table and a chair and like the absolute minimal furniture. I had nothing on the walls. I had minimal clothes, two pairs of shoes. And those were some of the happiest and stress-free years of my life. I didn't have a car to worry about. I didn't have, like, I was just, it was just like so carefree that it really dawned on me how, how I wouldn't say it's not even more so much stress. It's just like this heaviness that you're not aware of when you're maintaining a lot of things and most of which you don't need. I actually just cleaned out our toy area and, and I, um, you know, jealous of I'm sure I'd be jealous of your house because I have let mine get out of what I what I think is ideal but I think yeah we just don't appreciate how much it's clouding our ability to concentrate and it pulls down on our energy when there's just a lot of stuff and like more so when it's really stuff you absolutely really don't need yeah what's your experience been The best way like to describe it, I feel like people to understand like how much you're actually being weighed down by your stuff is, so we move every two to three years. So the military will show up at our house, pack everything up. We're not allowed to like pack any of it. And so I watch them pack all our stuff up and it takes them like half a day, which everyone else that's a military family around us, it takes them like three days. Like you're allotted like a certain amount of poundage and all this stuff, but then they show up on the other side and I can unpack my entire house in like that day they show up and still cook dinner, like have everything hung on the wall that I want on the wall and cook dinner in my own house the day my stuff gets delivered. When a lot of people are like months and months later, years later, they still have boxes in the garage. Like what's the point of having that stuff if you can't unpack it you know like I get it if it's like one box from your childhood where you're like well I don't really need to hang my baby blanket on the wall like but I'm going to keep moving this with me like okay but 
at the end of the day, I feel like whatever you can have all this stuff to like rearrange or be like, I want to have this in my house. I want to dust it. I want to clean it, whatever. But do we really want to have that? Or do we like the distraction of having that? Whereas like, I'm like, I'm very intentional with my time. How I was talking with social media of, I would rather read to my son than be like, I need to go dust all these bookshelves every week. So I think it's being a minimalist is a, in a sense, like um, a expression of being very intentional with your life, like your time, like what, how do I want to spend my time? Because I could have all these things and they need my maintenance. They need a home So, yeah, I love that you focus on the intentionality and the practicality of it. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to dust things. <laughs> uh, but can you tell us a little bit more about when you're working with people, you know, what are some of the major hangups that they have about getting rid of stuff? Or is it really just a lack of organization? So usually it's always moms will come to me and they'll be like, I'm tired of like constantly organizing and reorganizing and buying more things to organize all their stuff. And they're like, I want to start getting rid of all my stuff, but my kids don't, or my spouse doesn't. And so I will always tell them, we'll start with you. Like go the one part you're in control, go in your closet, just start getting rid of stuff. And the more and more like you're donating stuff, you're passing it on, then the rest of your family is going to notice and be like, oh, well, she's doing this and she seems a lot happier and has less clothes to like put away with the laundry. So maybe I should do that too. So a lot of times they think the mistake people make is they're like, I want to become a minimalist. And they come and they like attack the kitchen or the kids' toys first or like the husband's closet. And like, no, you got to start with yourself. Like you can't go... Yeah getting rid of other people's stuff, like get rid of your own stuff first and then lead by example of being like, no, I really don't want to add more to what I already have. I already am good managing this. Yeah. I recently gave away like 90% of my jewelry that I've been, you know, it's just been accumulating for decades. Then one of my grandmother, when one of my grandmother, my last grandmother passed away, that was like the one thing that was, held on to and I don't know there's just a lot of heavy energy that goes along with these things that are stored that you're never using but they're just there and to your point you know I, I work on myself first and I mean I, I would offer the tip to moms for regarding toys I rotate the toys so I take two or three big Rubbermaid things and store half the toys every once in a while. And sometimes they come back into the picture and sometimes they don't, but I have really observed in my kids when there's just too many toys, they don't want to play, you know, like, whereas if you put like one colorful set of blocks out on a table and there's nothing else going on, that's what they're going to play with versus shelves and shelves. And it's just overwhelming. And I think, you know, adults are the same way. It's just so much easier to engage with things when there's not this decision fatigue. Yeah, exactly. How old are your kids? They're seven and nine. Okay. So my son is right in the middle. He's eight, almost nine. And I feel like, so from the beginning, Kai has grown up where each what I normally do is I go with the seasons of the year. And so I'm like, okay, we're in winter now. Like we got to check in with our room. Is there toys we can pass on to friends? Are there toys that are broken? Are there toys you want to donate? Are there toys you want to sell? And I think too, the older they get, the selling them entices them more because like the other day we sold like a hundred dollars worth of Harry Potter stuff. And then he can save up for... Else, yeah. Yeah, because I think the hard thing too with, I'm a minimalist, but I also value high quality. 
And so teaching Kai, like, well, what can we buy that's high quality and going to last and stuff? Like, it's expensive to buy higher quality. So if he is done playing with stuff and doesn't want to donate it, but we can sell it, then it gives him more in savings to buy a new rocket he wants to do or something, you know? So I think that's a good tool, like, for kids that are our age or our children's age or older. Um, but also, like, Kai is so now used to, like, oh, yeah, mom always comes, like, being like, oh, is there anything, like, you're done? With? And we'll do it with his clothes, too. I'm like, are there any shirts, like, you know you're not going to wear? Like, you could take them to the farm, give them to your friends. And I'll lead by example of that, too. Like, I'll, in the same day, I'll ask him that, but also go through my closet or go through stuff in the house so it doesn't feel like it's just his stuff and so now he's super used to it and a lot of times in the beginning he'd be like no there's nothing there's nothing and I'd be like okay well I'm gonna go through my closet I'm gonna leave this bag here and I'll come back and in a little bit and it, like the bag would be like full like and it was like just go through the bends and stuff like and at the time that he would go through the bends then he would realize like oh yeah there is stuff yeah, I, I've done some similar. My kids are pretty, um, in, like you said, more excited to sell, but definitely willing to donate. Um, here where we live in Mexico, you know, it's a lot more, maybe not a lot more, but, you know, there's like a daily reminder of the the gap in income. And, um, you know, they're more than happy to pass on toys that they know, no, they're not going to be using anymore. Um, whether or not they're conscious, you know, of like the, how it's energetically pulling them down. I'm not sure yet, but, um, what else do you want to share with us about your, your work and, and what are you currently passionate about? I think too, how you were saying, like the more they have, the less they, like their imagination can't take off and go and do stuff when it's like, there's these perfectly curated like playrooms, you know, of like shelves and shelves of I'm all about like we homeschool and we do Waldorf. And so all the wood toys and stuff are beautiful and everything, but having like floor to ceiling wood shelves of all this stuff, like you would walk in there and it'd be like, yeah, that could be a really cool library if we lived like in what's that movie, like um, beauty and the beast and all this. But for a kid, like, it's super overwhelming to be like, where do I start? What do I play? And so I feel like how you're saying you, you rotate bins of what to play with. I don't do that. But what I do do is every couple of months, I'll just be like, hey, Kai, is it okay if I go in your room and just reorganize and rearrange stuff? And he's always like, sure. And then he'll come back and he's like, oh my gosh, like I, his imagination then will like, restart and he'll want to play yeah Yeah, so I felt like anytime he's like more like stuck and not like really getting into the play I'm like okay that's when I need to go in there and like shift things or we need to like take some stuff out because then it feels like it's almost like there's too many things going on there and he just goes in there and he's like no I don't want to do it yeah can you share with us maybe what um you mentioned that moms in general come and they they feel like tired of the organization of the maintaining of of the stuff is are there any sort of I don't know other telltale signs that someone might be experiencing that it's a good red flag that it's time to consider minimalism or at least you know taking a look at minimizing to some extent what you have in your home your kitchen your closet whether whatever it's you want to focus on so uh, most of my friends actually all my friends that have ever come to my house like and then I've always welcomed people into my house for wellness like a holistic wellness of fitness food different things but everyone always comes into my house and leaves and then goes and get rid of, gets rid of tons of stuff and they're like I got rid of all these things without me ever saying like come over and you're going to get rid of all this stuff like but you just feel this different ease when you walk into a space and you're like ah like like for example right now we're in an airbnb and we have been in i don't know 100 airbnbs now at this point in our life and 
you walk into some and you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff and I'm overwhelmed. Or you walk in and you're like, okay, I can do this. Like, so there's this instant feeling when you walk into a space, whether it's your own home or someone else's of if how your brain's going to feel, like what you're going to be able to do. So if you wake up every morning, you're laying in your bed and you're like, I have this, 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 this on my to-do list. And then you walk to the kitchen and you're like, I can't even think about my to-do list because my kitchen has dishes everywhere and all these things that I feel like it's just a feeling everyone knows in their own home, their own space, that they're like, I have too much stuff. Like I can't keep up. And some people are really comfortable, like with that feeling or with having a lot of things. But if they're the one having to manage it, I feel like they very quickly are like, I'm not okay with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can only say good things and it's, it's so freeing. Like even I mean, I would recommend that you just pick a space and it can be as small as a drawer, you know, to start. For me, it's my office every once in a while, my closet, the toy area, just certain spaces like that when I do it, I'm quite ruthless. Um, part of it's organization, but always it's it's just it's like a recharging of energy of the space and so that when you walk in, it's just this, ah, like you said, and I think we all like, we're all very in tune to that because most, you know, Airbnbs or fine hotels are minimalist. And maybe it's not something we're conscious that we like about walking into those spaces, but it's definitely gives you a sense of, of ease. So have you ever, a really cool thing to pay attention to is a couple of years ago, I got really into aligning myself with the lunar cycle in each month going through the moon phases and usually if you naturally like to rearrange and change stuff we all do it on the new moon whether Hmm. we realize it or not and so I started tracking that and it was like if I like wake up and I'm like gonna rearrange the whole house today and I would do it and then I would look at my calendar and be like yep it's the new moon that's why I did that today so are we close to a new moon right now no, we're actually like in the middle. So oh. the full moon. Well, then I'm off. <laughs> this the day was the day. But for me, sometimes, and I'm sure it's the same with other moms or other women, that it's, it's more of like when you have the time. Um, but it also too, it's getting so close to the holiday. And it, I feel like the closer and close, especially right now, like December should be the most, <laughs> I did this thing that was like, what is the most overwhelming month for minimalists? It's December because packages are just showing up and showing up and no matter how you're like no like just one present is fine you don't need 10 like so December is a little overwhelming so I usually yeah rearrange and do a lot of more purging that month than any other month yeah um let's let's end off can you give we'll each share a couple of of tips on how to be more intentional on social media. Let's loop it back to beginning of our conversation. And the one of the benefits of social media in terms of meeting really cool, like-minded people and having these interesting conversations. But for you, like what have you done in on in or on your social media that makes it easier for you to be intentional when you are spending time online? So I love photography I do photography and um so to me social media is a part of art to me so I like capturing these moments I love storytelling so I'll write stories about it and so it honestly doesn't feel like work to me it just feels like instead of like journaling to myself it's kind of like journaling out loud that someone else can get inspired and go use it and maybe they wake up and they read this post and that's finally that changing moment in their life and like, no I want to do this and so that's why I show up every day take pictures story tell and hope that it'll will help others yeah no I've really um loved following you since since I found you about a month ago uh in particular I love that you take a lot of pictures of fires because it always just makes <laughs> it reminds me of like how much I love that. And I don't do it enough anymore. Um, but yeah, you're always outside, which I love. Um, for me, I'll just suggest that 
yeah, just clean up, clean up your feed. You know, if you're worried about someone being offended that you unfollow them, you can mute people. Um, but I think in this day and age, I don't know, like, I think it's really good to purge your, your, who you're following every once in a while as well. And, um, one thing that I do is I have, I use the folders quite a bit specifically to Instagram. So if I keep, like, I have a folder called vision board. I have a folder called human design. I have a folder called, uh, you know, like maybe something for my kids. So anytime I see these things, I, if I don't have the energy or the time to read it, or, you know, if I just want to capture it, um, for me, it's, it's a great way to have access to these things, but not necessarily be continually consuming that sort of content. And um, what else? I don't no, know. That's I a think... great, that's a great tool to have it. It's interesting to you mention human design because I have been like geeking out on that for the last like year. And it's <laughs> Me too. funny, like all the people I've been connecting with, they're like, Oh no, I have been too. And I'm like, there's and then one of my friends was like no everyone that's like all of a sudden into human design like she was connecting all these bigger things and I was like it's crazy how like friends I've had like 15 20 years ago they're like oh yeah I just heard about this human design do you know your type and your profile and I was like I do (laughs) (laughs) what's your type I am a generator six three profile I'm a generator five one. So my son is a five one. Yeah. Which I think the human design chart is such a good tool for parenting because like my son being a five one, I'm like, if I'm like, hey Kai, I have a problem, can you solve it for me? Like or like can you help me out? He is like lit up like I'm a problem solver. I want to do and And then I'm like, okay, I need to be patient and answer his thousand questions a day because he's an investigator. He wants to know all the things. And, but it's been really fun. Our homeschool co-op, I did all the parents, all the kids, and I taught them all their, like everything I knew about. Mainly I focused on the type and the profile. I didn't go into their nine centers and all the other stuff because they're younger, but the kids loved learning like who they were and more about themselves and they're like that's why I do that like it really I feel like helped them understand themselves of being like oh I need like some especially the kids that are more the hermit profile type and like, that's why I want my alone time and so it's a yeah it's a super cool tool we have yeah I, f- I find it's an empowering tool particularly when you learn more about where in your body you should be tuning into to make decisions. I think people find that really helpful. And then I, I seem to personally attract a lot of clients that are projectors. And so it's this process of giving themselves permission to not feel like their energy flow has to be the same as the majority of us, like you and I generators can happily work a good six hours and if we're doing something we love or it's projector it needs you know they're like two three hour bursts um or like hardcore for two or three weeks and then like a whole week off you know and uh, honoring your your ebb and flow of energy I think is is really important too that's really interesting because a lot of my really good friends are projectors and then some are manifestors and so I'm like you guys just use me of like Vanessa I have this idea go and do this for me and like <laughs> they like start it and they're like Vanessa can you just finish it for me and I'm like sure got it <laughs> yeah we've got the energy the work the work ethic that, that aligns with the the societal norm if you will but um yeah I think it just becomes important to know at least if you can wrap your brain around something that excites you about what you're working on, it's a lot more doable than focusing yeah, for on. me. I think for generators, we all have our authority from our sacral energy, right? So it's like yeah. listening to that instant, uh-huh or uh-uh. Like for me, I had to learn that for a while because I would always say like, yes to everything. 
and I didn't realize I was people pleasing. And then I would be like, oh, please cancel, please cancel, please cancel. I don't want to do it. Like, and so I would be like, okay. And now I'm like very like, Vanessa, if you're not instantly like, uh-huh, you want to do this? Say no. Like, But it took me quite a few years to get there. Yeah. I think particularly as women, we're socialized to be people pleasers. So it's extra hard, but it's definitely worth it to to practice really tuning in and, you know, doing what aligns with you and no apologies for, you shouldn't have to apologize for saying no when you don't want to do something. Yes, definitely. All right. Well, let's wrap it up because we were going to talk for 20 minutes and I think we're well over that. So any sort of last parting words, um, before we say goodbye today i don't think so i think just if anyone's feeling burnt out from social media or community like finding something that relights your fire whether it's human design or i love reading the book women who run with the wolves and reading one story or like joining you know like there's anything you love you can find people that also love that and then you have something to look forward to, whether it's five minutes in your day, 10 minutes or an hour. Like, so finding those people and feeling supported and also supporting them. Yeah. And like you said, sort of off the top, you know, I think, um, I think we still have a little bit of stigmatism around this idea of making friends online that they're not like real friends <laughs> or, you know, that it's, there's still some sort of, that is less authentic. And I, I don't feel that way. I feel like I've made really powerful connections with women that I'm not sure I'll ever meet in person um, that have made me feel supported. And, you know, that I check in with certainly not on a daily basis, but, you know, every couple of weeks and we just check in with each other and make sure, you know, and see what's going on and having, like-minded women that understand the things that you're interested in and know that you don't have to explain the whole conversation. The back end of the conversation is, is really nice. Definitely. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I look forward to publishing this episode and following you on your journey, checking in with you every once in a while for uh, amazing homeschooling and, and um, minimalism tips Yes, I'm so glad that I found you on the world of social media. It's nice to find so many like-minded people. Awesome. We'll be in touch.